Good evening. This is the Daily Drum for Wednesday, February 28th. Here's what's happening. Three more people have been arrested and charged in the murder of Duval High School student Jada Madreno Moore. The 16-year-old was shot to death near the school last September while trying to break up a fight. 18-year-olds Ramon Richardson of Lanham and Cameron Anderson of Landover are charged with first and second degree murder. A 17-year-old male from Lanham is also charged as an adult with first degree murder. Late today, congressional leadership agreed to a deal preventing a partial shutdown of the federal government Friday at midnight. The deal pushes back funding deadlines until later in March, it gives lawmakers more room to work on the $1.7 trillion spending package. Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell is stepping down as GOP leader in November. He made the announcement today on the Senate floor saying it's time for the next generation of leadership. But now it's 2024. I'm now 82. As Ecclesiastes is as these tells us, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose. On the McConnell go said on he'll step down as minority leader after the November elections. He will serve out the remainder of his term, which ends in January 2027. Also on Capitol Hill, House members are debating a measure that would transfer control of the RFK stadium site to the city. It would come in the form of a 99-year lease with the National Park Service. The mayor wants to see a new Washington Commander Stadium housing and retail space built. The majority of Maryland lawmakers plan to vote no because they want the team to stay in Maryland. Two-thirds of House members need to vote yes for the measure to pass, and then it'll go to the Senate for debate. And speaking of commanders, FedEx Field is no more. The team announced today that FedEx is opting out of the naming rights deal for the Landover Maryland Stadium two years before it was set to expire. It will be named Commander's Field. Team owners said they're already looking for a new partner. Here's a look at our weather now. Today's warm weather is changing. High wind will bring in lower temperatures and rain. Expect wind gusts to reach 40 to 50 miles per hour. Lows in the 30s. Tomorrow, sunny and cool. Still windy, but not as much. Highs near 50. Well, coming up, the Reporters' Roundtable looks at some of the top stories of the week. Insight is next on WHUR and WHUT-TV. On the go and on demand, WHUR and WHUT are with you. Download the WHUR app today to get full access to shows, playlists, and our latest contests. To access WHUT on demand, download the PBS app and make Howard University Television your station. Catch up on our WHUT original productions anytime, anyplace on YouTube at WHUT-TV. WHUR and WHUT, better together. You may have noticed something different on Monday nights at 8 p.m. on WHUT. We like to call it Must See DMV. As part of our mission to amplify your stories on your station, you'll get to see some of the finest works from our creators who call D.C., Maryland, and Virginia home. It's Must See DMV, Monday nights starting at 8 p.m. right here on WHUT, Howard University Television. Welcome back to The Daily Drum on WHUR, Sirius XM Channel 141, and WHUT-TV. This is the Insights segment. I'm Harold Fisher. We are at the Reporters' Roundtable with a look at some of the top stories of the week. My guests are Keith Alexander, Pulitzer Award-winning D.C. crime and courts reporter with The Washington Post, and Deborah Bailey, contributing editor with the Afro-American newspapers. On deck tonight... Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell stepping down from his leadership post in November. Former President Trump continues to make inappropriate jokes about black people on the campaign trail. Maryland tries a different approach to tackle poverty. And big changes are coming to FedEx Field. We are talking about it all, and certainly you can X me at H. Fisher, W-H-U-R, or find me on Instagram at Harold T. Fisher, what's happening, guys? Hey. Good to see you, ma'am. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Good to be seen. So, first and foremost, this, this information about Mitch McConnell, making that announcement today, uh, big, big news, 
the longest serving GOP leader in the Senate, Deborah. Uh, it's a watershed moment, or at least it will be. It, it, it definitely has been, is now, and will be. Mitch is getting out before the getting out of his own party is getting on him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Keith, uh, such a such a big deal, and and already I'm sure there's some some jockeying for position. Right, but this is not a surprise, right? right? Mitch Connell, Mitch, Mitch has been ill. He's, you know, he, he's he's up in age in his 80s. He's he's been in this position for for nearly 20 years. This should not come as a surprise. Um, but yes, now we're going to see people jockeying for this position. Who's going to get in? It's a different Republican Party than yeah. when Mitch McConnell started. And I think that's also part of that. And he kind of talked about that. He said it's now time for new leaders to come in. Um, and so now you're going to see over these next few months who is going to be positioning themselves to fill his shoes. It'll be very interesting to watch. But also, he's staying in place as a senator. He's not exactly. going anywhere he's for not two going years. Anywhere. Right. He just wants to lead up as, as, as a leader of the party. Yeah. Let's hear a little bit of what about uh, from him about what he said uh, from the well of the Senate today. Father time remains undefeated. I'm no longer the young man sitting in the back hoping colleagues would remember my name. It's time for the next generation of leadership. That piece about the next generation of mm -hmm. leadership, I think, is critical because there's been so much talk about not just Mitch McConnell, but the issue of age mm -hmm. on Capitol Hill. I mean, you know, Biden and Trump notwithstanding, but just you know, that's you know, where you're talking about the House, where you're talking about the the Senate, mm -hmm. you know. You've got, uh, you know, 60-year-olds, 70-year-olds, 80-year-olds, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you know, Diane Feinstein, of course, was, what, 90-something? Oh, 90-something. Yeah. yeah, when, you know, when she, when she passed away. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think that this is going to be a signal for some of the older members, uh, Senate or House, one way or another, uh, for them to set, to step down, but I think Deborah, this is going to uh, bring this conversation back. Mm -hmm. It's age, but it's also era. I think Mitch McConnell understood when the House of Representatives leadership started changing on a dime last year that the era that he represents is no longer the era of the Republican Party that exists today. So it, it is age, it is age, but it is also the era that um, the the Republican Party that Mitch McConnell um, represents, that's not who Republicans are today. Yeah. But I, but I can't help but wonder, we keep saying age, but I'll, I can't help also but wonder about his, his health. I yeah, mean, we yeah. have mm -hmm. seen this man have health issues yes. in front of the entire world. Mm -hmm. I would think that if it wasn't for his health issues, he probably would not be uh, stepping down. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I think the heat started turning up. I, I agree with you, though, that, that health probably trumped everything. But I also think the heat started, started, started trumping up on him. I think that um, Republicans in the Senate um, certainly are more genteel than their House colleagues in how they let you know it's, your time is over. But I, I, I think it was a combination of all three. Like you said, with health probably leading the three. But let us say that b before today, the Republicans in the House, you know, still understood that he held he held the reins of power. That before today, it, it had not changed, and 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 Mitch McConnell has historically been able to keep the rank and file, whether he was minority leader or majority leader. He's kept folks in line. Uh, debatably or arguably, I should say, more than the Republicans have been able to. And I think that with him gone, as you said, people are going to start, you know, jockeying for position. And to be quite honest, we, you know, he, he has been very vocal about not being uh, a, a fan of the former president so much. <laughs> and he has given him certainly some pushback. So I think it'll be... The former president, you mean Trump? Exactly. Mm -hmm. okay. And so... I think that it will be interesting to see uh, how how all of this plays out uh, moving forward, because now it's going to be a lot of glad handing. Um, 
uh, congratulations and and, ring and we saw some of that today. a lot of ring kisses. Yeah, you know, there are people who, who want the, that position are really going because he's not going anywhere. They're going to have to kiss that ring, right. and he is going to he's going to have a large say in who I believe he's going to have a say in who's mm -hmm. going to. Feel his, his yeah, the pressure. Senate, Senate is more genteel than the House, so um, he will have a say, um, although there's a whole new crop of senators coming up, too. Yeah. I, I, I want to move on to Donald Trump, and, and there has been some news that has come out uh, just a couple of hours ago that the Supreme Court has agreed mm -hmm. to take on the immunity case for the former president. This has a direct bearing on the January 6th case and, uh, and, and Jack Smith. Certainly, the, the president has said that, you know, he is, you know, he is immune mm -hmm. to any kind of prosecution. And for those of you of a, of a certain age, he is kind of repeating one of the things that Richard Nixon said uh, after, after he resigned. Well, if the president does it, uh, then it's not illegal. And so now the, uh, the pres uh, former President Trump is, has, has said that, you know, he is immune from, you know, prosecution uh, in, in all things. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is, Keith, that now we have to wait on the Supreme Court. And, you know, they could do this right away. It mm -hmm. is unlikely that they will do mm -hmm. this right away. And as we move towards the election, right? Um, you know, hypothetically speaking, if he becomes president, all this goes away. This, the, the timing is, people will be watching this like with, with bated breath. You know, I mean, this is gonna be something that, that's unprecedented, right? Again, here we are again talking about something that's never happened before in this country. And now the Supreme Court has agreed to take on this case. And so now voters will be like, well, what do we do? Do we vote? Do we not vote for this man? Because you no, know, he could very well go to, go to go to case. Jack Smith is like, we gotta get this in front of the, uh, the, the Supreme before uh, November, before the election. As you said, it's probably unlikely that the Supremes will actually come have a decision. The or Supremes. At least, <laughs> that's that's what, we put it, that's what they're called the Supremes uh, here, here in DC. Oh really? Uh, the, the Supreme Court. Baby, uh, baby, the Supremes. Baby. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come to a, a decision and actually hear the case. Hear the case and then rule, because even though they hear the case, it's still going to be months before they actually issue a ruling. <laughs> so all this by, by November is already March. I don't know because right. the trial was supposed to start in March. Right. Right, right, right. Well, all of this is on hold now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, one way to see it, one way to see it. This is a really nice transition between um, your last topic and this topic, because the last topic, the Senate, your Senate leader, his last job was to get Amy Coney Berry and Kavanaugh on the court. That was his last real job. Yes. Um, and now he got them on the court, and they're there now to, um, <laughs> to, to do what they do. And one way of seeing it, one way that I would teach my, my class to see it, is that the Supreme Court's role might be to, um, to look at the best interests of our country. And would it be in the best interests of the country to have a former president and a presidential candidate um, um, <laughs> go, go to trial? Or would it be in our, the best interest of our country to delay the decision so that you don't have to have them go to trial before well, the again, election comes? You know, the, the big argument has always been no one is above the law. That's right. We, we've heard that before. Uh, we have, you know, we have seen, you know, his base energized because of all of these legal, all of these legal issues. And... I don't think we we have a true understanding of what would happen if SCOTUS, not the Supremes, but the SCOTUS, <laughs> you know, the, the Supreme Court of the United States. I, it, we, don't, we don't have a handle on what if they say no one is above the law, you've got to go through this. And... It still doesn't mean he would go through it before the election. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, of course, you know... Even though his his civil case, you know, up in up in New York, you know, that's you know that that's kicking back up. We've got the the Georgia case right now, and and the soap opera, uh, no, no, no. you know, that that is down there. Uh, certainly uh, interesting, newsworthy, but entertaining. Here's the question: A lot of people are also wondering if, whether or not uh, Clarence Thomas will recuse himself. 
mm. because of his wife. Now, that would be unusual. I, I, I would argue he probably will not. I, I don't think but, so. But people are saying, well, you know, his wife was very much saying that this the whole, you know, everything was, he, that, that Trump should be the president, that the election was stolen. Um, and because she's gone on record saying that, should Thomas be part of this decision? But he's, he's not going to recuse himself. Right. And, and all this goes to the whole p pillow talk right. thing. And, and there are even, even the United States Senate, I don't think that there was a law passed, but, but there, there has been at least um, a request that the Supreme Court create some rules for itself. Um, create, create some rules for yourself. We're not going to create the rules for you, but at least create some rules of conduct for yourself. And that, that hasn't come um, forth from the Supreme Court. So whatever decision people want to um, participate in, they, they will. Well, you know, again, uh, appointment for life. So why, why should I do anything to, to correct myself? I mean, that's, you know, that's easy. Um, we, we've got to move on to some more uh, Donald Trump stuff. And one of the things that happened even as he... Uh, was in South Carolina. He beat Nikki Haley mm -hmm. um, in the in the South Carolina primary. But he said this to the Black Conservative Federation mm -hmm. in Columbia. Mm -hmm. Listen to this. These lights are so bright in my eyes that I can't see too many people out there. But uh, I can only see the black ones. I can't see any white ones. You see, that's how far I've come. That's how far I've come. That's a long, that's a long way, isn't it? These eyes. <laughs> Did he say the quiet part out loud? Uh, th that he said any of it out loud and that any of them were out there um, in, in South Carolina uh, cheering for him. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's sad. But not surprising. Oh, no. Not anymore. Not anymore. No. Exactly. Not, not anymore. Um, I see you wearing pearls. Can I clutch your pearls? <laughs> I would have clutched your pearls in, in 2016. Mm. No more pearl clutching right. Right. now. But I, I think th the thing that, that I find interesting and probably most disturbing is conservative re black Republicans, um, there's nothing wrong with being a... a a black Republican. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, but as a black person, uh, I don't, I, I still think that you need to stand up, speak up, speak out when, you know, when, when someone is, is, is being disrespectful. And, and some not so conservative. So some black folk who have say, um, there's, there's decided they want to vote right. for Donald Trump. No, we're not talking about conservative. Right. We're just talking about um, black folk who are like, yeah, I'm with, I'm with Trump. Or black people <laughs> who are saying, you know what, I did better financially mm -hmm. when Trump was in office. And a lot of black people have said that they did better financially when Trump was in office. So it's not just conservative Republicans. Um, there's some independents, and there are some people who actually right. believe that that financially, that they, that the economy, that the, this country did better under Trump. To that, and to that point, the just yesterday we were talking about the uh, the Howard University's uh, initiative on public opinion, and they they took a poll of black voters in Michigan, released it last Friday, mm -hmm. right before the you know the Michigan primary. And one of the things that, it, that they found was that there was some growth in support for Donald Trump by black voters. Mm -hmm. and, and that, you know, the economy mm -hmm. and housing were the top issues. And no matter what those of us in the news business are saying about issues regarding the environment, uh, LGBTQIA issues. Those, those issues, for example, were really, really far down. And, and if that is the case, if that is a, a snapshot for 
for black voters. And we are talking about, you know, Michigan and, you know, there's there's the whole thing about um, uh, the, you know, the Muslim Americans who were voting mm -hmm. and, and, not, and being noncommittal. Mm -hmm. um, and they were a reliable support for, for Joe Biden. Right. But we had some 100,000 votes yesterday uh, that were that were non-committal in in this race, and so that may suggest some tough times for you know for Joe Biden or even a closer race for the two of them. Mm -hmm. And I think what we saw when Trump made when made this comment, he feels very comfortable. Yes, that he that more black people are voting for that he's that he has now been accepted that I can now, that he can now joke. He can now say these things because he now has a growing following of African Americans. That's what that 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 statement said to me. That he feels much more comfortable in in seeing this this growth and in, in support among African Americans. And if he can he's get, not see the first time. And if he get ten percent, that that is a margin of increase for him. It doesn't matter if he if he he doesn't want uh, want to even need the majority. He just wants to have a grow, a growth margin mm -hmm. enough to get him back in the seat. And enough to say, okay, I'll give you black people a few pennies. So explain something to me, because and and I'll ask this of, of you, Deborah, uh, you know, as a black person, as a black woman. Um, indeed, I am. Yes, indeed, I'm black too. How about that? Okay. Um, but this is a good way to to head out before the break. Uh, were you offended by the comment? Um, to, to be to be offended, that would mean I I, I was not offended because I, I just can't put enough. Um, I don't put I don't put any stake in his personality. I'm not talking about were you offended by what Trump said? Are you were, were would you if someone else had said it? That, another white person that would just be absolutely stupid. That's my point. Yes, and that's my point. It you know the I found I found it you know offensive. Well, Trump knew exactly what he was doing. But what is he doing? What do you think he's doing, uh, aside from saying that, yes, I'm comfortable enough, mm -hmm. but w is he doing something, something else? G grabbing a headline and grabbing those black people who are like, yeah, come on, you my boy, you know you my boy, you know you my, what did he call a man four years ago? I mean, there, there my a... African American. My... Yes, yeah. yes he did. Like my, yes, my yes he did. Yes he said that. You know you my you my African American. And for people who respond to that, and who is are like, okay, well I can get two more pennies from Trump. That's what he wants. That's all he wants. And it's also I think it's also he letting people know that this is not an all white crowd. Mm -hmm. Well that that crowd was an all black. I mean almost all black. Crowd. Yeah, and let people because it was the Black Conservative Federation. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So no. My black folk, I'm mm -hmm. here with, with you all. That's right. And I think that's that's what that's what that was about. Is is, is my, my homies. Yeah. Right. That I can feel comfortable joking with you all, and and, and you all invited me here, mm -hmm. so we have that rapport. So I I can say what I want. Mm -hmm. Does perceived racism take a a, a backseat to economic issues? It for some you people, talk, say, you better understand. Right. For some people. I think you, I don't think that's a, that, I don't think you can a monolith there. I, I think it depends on really who that who they are, how they came up, where they are now. I think everyone has their own issues. You, you said earlier, you know, everyone has dealing with their own issues, and that's what it comes down to. For some folk, racial racial issue is not a big issue. I care more about putting food on my table for my kids. I don't care what you call me. I that's just right. want more green in my wallet. Mm. So I really think that's that it really it depends on who you're talking to. Don't care who you are, what you call me. Is there some money on the table? There you go. Uh, we're about to take a break, but when we come back, uh, you've got Jordans, Nikes, <laughs> Under Armour. Did you, you get your Trump tennis shoes? We're going to talk about that and hear from a Fox News pundit and what he said about it. Stay with us. <laughs> the Daily Drum will continue on Sirius XM Channel 141, WHUR, and WHUT TV. And don't forget, you can hear every edition of the Daily Drum Insight segment via podcast on WHUR.com. Post it after 9 o'clock every night. I'm Harold Fisher. John Mons is next with the original Quiet Storm. That's on WHUR. We'll be back with more of the Reporters Roundtable in just a bit.
WHUT is dedicating weekdays at 1030 a.m. to bring you the best of our locally produced series, like our arts and artists show, Artico, our energetic music series, DMV The Beat. Get Out, when I wrote that song, we were fighting. And stories highlighting the endurance of the human spirit with legacy. He used to say to me all the time, when, I'm, when I die, the newspaper is yours. So remember, tune in weekdays at 1030 a.m. Howard University Television PBS and WHUR 96.3 are joining forces Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. as we bring you Harold Fisher and the Daily Drum live as we take you inside the stories of the DMV. We've got the experts and the people that matter most to help you make informed decisions for your family and your community. That's the Daily Drum Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. live on WHUT and WHUR better together. Welcome back to the Daily Drum on WHUR, Sirius XM Channel 141 and WHUT TV. We are at the Reporters Roundtable with a look at some of the top stories of the week. My guests are Keith Alexander, Pulitzer Award winning DC crime and courts reporter for the Washington Post and Deborah Bailey, contributing editor with the Afro-American newspapers. Remember, you can X me at H Fisher WHUR or find me on Instagram at Harold T. Fisher. Still uh, on the Trump train right now, but this next piece of sound is not about what the former president said, but who we're going to hear from next is Fox News commentator Raymond Arroyo. And he said this over the weekend on the big weekend show on, on Fox on Sunday. See black support eroding from Joe Biden. This is connecting with black America because they love sneakers. They're into sneakers. They love the, you know, th this is a big deal, certainly in, in the inner city. So when you have Trump roll out his sneaker line, they're like, wait a minute, this is cool. He's reaching them on a level that defies and is above politics. The culture always trumps politics. And Trump understands culture like no politician I've ever seen. Question for you on that point, though. Yeah. Will the people that are excited about the sneakers and excited about Donald Trump Will that translate into them going out and voting for Donald Trump? Well, anybody willing to put 400 bucks down for a pair of sneakers? Yeah, I think that's commitment and love. I it's hope something. You're right. It's something. It's affection. Mm. Deborah, what are you wearing? <laughs> I'm not, not them sneakers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, what in the entire heck? Um, that, I, I, I know pundits have a, have a tendency to to pontificate, to go off, off the rails. But that, to me, was even more uh, insulting. It spoke to some of the worst stereotypes of, of black people. And, you know, and I just, I, I don't understand how someone could even possibly say that when... You know, you know, black people are just there is so much more than, you know, than wearing, you know, lining up for sneakers. Not only Arroyo and, and just just the raw, raw racism, but even the questions that the, the other reporter was asking here. Just um, just um, a, a total misunderstanding of, of black culture. I, it was I, Fox News, was it not? That's true. So I, I mean, you need to keep that into perspective. Right, that's true. It is, this is Fox News. They have an audience. They have um, a script that many of the, of the reporters and anchors kind of follow. Again, people really should not be surprised by this, be considering that this is sort of what a lot of people on Fox News put out there, on Fox National News put out there. Um, so is it surprising? No. That's, again, not to me. This is, what the, this is, the, this is their audience. Um, the question is, but he does raise a good question. Well, the reporter raised a good question. People who buy these sneakers in the urban community, black folk, are they going to actually wear those sneakers to the polls? That's the big question. And I'll be surprised to see how many black people actually walk around wearing these sneakers. And that's the thing that I was going to say. <laughs> we don't have any uh, information that, that suggests that even though they, they sold out, that a line allegedly exactly how right, about that right right that piece. you never know when it's uh, you you don't know that that a 
a large percentage of the people who purchase them uh, are black people. And, and I, to me, it just also goes, Fox News, I get it, but it, it's just a reminder to me of the ignorance that is, is happening in this, uh, in, in this country. And, you know, I, I just wonder, and it's very likely that Raymond Arroyo, probably before talking about this, he, he went to ask his one black friend. <laughs> but now I tell you, go out to rural America, you're going to see some other folk with <coughs> sneakers on and they don't look like me. Um, you know, n number one, if you're going to give me a $400 pair of sneakers, I, I don't want them to look like, like what Trump brought out. Number two, um, it, th this is 2024. You know, let Arroyo do what he wants to do. If if the people that he that listen to him on Fox are still there where they buy this, you know how black folk like them sneakers. Mm -hmm. If they, if that's where anyone in white America still is, then then go ahead and be there. It's it's twenty two. It's we, we, we we're almost midway through the twenty first century. If that's where you still are, go on and be there. But say what you want about, about Trump. I mean, he knows how to grab headlines. We, mm -hmm. we, we all established that. Trump also is going to have, have a, lot, a lot of bills to pay over the next few months. That you better understand. So you better believe this That's is why the first and last time we're going to see something like this over That's the next right. few weeks and months. We're going to see Trump rolling up more things right. for people to purchase to help offset uh, what's happening in, in New York, all these, all these payments he has to do in New York. Th there you go. So this is not going to be the... This is not, we want to see a whole lot more of this. He got to pay that woman, and he got to pay New York City. Right. So this is, like, I agree with you, this comes down from everything with Trump is a sales pitch. Ev everything. Everything with him is a sales pitch. And a, and a headline. Right. So, so, and to that point, uh, you know, we're all in the news business. And are we missing something in the coverage of, of Donald Trump. I mean, we, we know that in 2016, he sucked all the air out of the room, okay? Uh, mainstream, uh, progressive, uh, conservative and news organizations and, and it, whatever, everybody was chasing him. And at the same time, you know, he is right now, you know, the presumptive Republican nominee. Um, but are we doing a disservice by covering every single thing that he says? Well, you know, that was a question that... In 2016. We, that, yeah, that's the question we had before in, in the media. Um, but now, here's the thing. The media outlets can, can gauge how well re readers are, are reading these stories. And if, if all, every time you click on a story, yes. that sends a note to the editors, oh, yes. readers want to read more about yes. this, let's give them what they want. Yes. If you don't click on the stories, yes. the readers, editors will say, oh, well, they're not interested, let's move on. Yes. But these stories are, in the, are being chased by reporters because yes. people are clicking on the stories, not only in print, but also on TV yes. and he, in the radio. He understands business. And he, underst he understands the media, and he understands the condition that the, that the media is in in the United States, too. And if you click on stories, then, ooh, we can stay in business. Our outlet, we don't have to lay people off. Come on now about the media. So um, when the stories get, start getting clicked on and, ooh, Trump comes back, people are going to come and read all of these fantastic things. And, ooh, we can sell papers. We can have viewers watch our programs. We can have people listening to the radio. And we are all happy in the media because we all have jobs. Come on now. Trump understands that. The thing that we are, we are missing in the reporting industry, and we miss it the first time, it's like I thought we learned, is that Trump is a master at deflection. So he's like, look over there. Don't you see the plane falling out of the sky? While he's doing something over here. Mm-hmm. And so I, I thought that we, as the media, learned that lesson already. Because we chased the, the plane falling out of the sky about four or five times before, oh, well, he was busy doing this. No, I, I, I think reporters learn to do both. Okay. You have some reporters chasing the plane to fall out of the sky. You have, mm -hmm. we have other reporters following on the, on the other side. I think journalists have, have learned. Have learned. To, okay, to, to that, that, that's, that's his strategy. Yeah. So that, that, that's my question now. What is the strategy while he is deflecting with all these fantastical things like the shoes and the whatever else? What's really going on? Yeah. Well, we will continue to follow that.
Whether to do shiny things, right? Yes, right. <laughs> What's the latest shiny thing? Mm -hmm. Alice Gold Shoes. Well, yeah, I was about to say. Very good. <laughs> there you go. Um, I, I want to you know, talk about a, a, a local issue. And this, this came up yesterday in Riverdale. Maryland Lieutenant uh, Governor Aruna Miller, uh, along with Prince George's County e Executive Angela Alsobrook, also Brooks, they were in Riverdale to promote the Enough Act, which is, you know, currently uh, moving through this, the uh, state legislature in Annapolis. And the thing that I find really interesting uh, about this is it is designed to, to locate pockets of poverty mm -hmm. in the state and once looking at those pockets of poverty to analyze why these pockets are there and then partner with community organizations to address those issues. That is, if the Enough Act passes. And already the governor has set aside some $15 million to, to do that. Um, you know, allow me to, to quote a, a paraphrase of scripture. You know, Jesus said, the poor will always be with us. <laughs> and, but that doesn't mean that we can't um, attempt to address that issue. But um, I, I question how an organization is going to attack these things. And I think this is, you know, very well-meaning, but is it, is it going to work? You know, is that the first time that Maryland has tried to address this issue in the, in the past? They've done something similar in the past with, with, with various administrations. I think what's, what's different now is that you have a, a governor and, and you have a uh, officials who are saying, okay, let's try something different. And I think they believe that this is something different. And the set aside of $15 million to go for this um, is something that I don't remember being that, that high in the past. So there is a larger pot that's devoted to this issue. Um, but I, my question is, okay, so how long are we going to do this? What's, what's the end game? What's the strategy? Right. And uh -huh. you, you, once you identify over what time period, then or are you going to keep throwing the money at, throwing the money at this at this issue? Um, I don't know. It also comes as, as also Brooke is also you know trying to 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 to, to uh, get higher up in, in politics, uh, running for, running for, for for Senate, right? I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so, is it a coincidence? I don't know. I, I think that she also has plans. This is part of her agenda is to try to get more funding for issues like that she was seen in Prince George's County. And this has been the issue in Prince George's County for sure. It's certainly symbolic that they had the press conference in, in Riverdale Thanks. in Prince George's County. But unless something has changed, um, the politics in Maryland, it, it's, it's been like this since I was a kid. How Baltimore and Prince George's go, so goes the rest of the state. And there are all kinds of pockets of poverty in this state. There's your urban po uh, pocket of poverty in, in Baltimore, uh, certainly in Prince George's County. But then you've got... In Frederick, up in Frederick. You've got mm -hmm. the rural yes. communities. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, very much so. And... and Hagerstown. And, exactly. Yes. And yes. $15 million when you start looking at what's happening on the eastern shore, what is happening in southern Maryland, mm -hmm. in, these, in these pockets of poverty, Deborah, uh, $15 million doesn't seem, at least to me, like enough. Yeah, it's not a whole lot of money. However, if you are the governor of one of the wealthiest states with one of the highest um, incomes per capita in the United States, then, uh, and if you have aspirations to do anything else, then one of the things that you do need to do is to, um, to give some attention to um, the poorest people in your state who live among folk with the highest per capita incomes in the nation. But how, how do you believe, let, let us say, that there is a community or a pocket of extreme poverty that is identified 
somewhere in Prince George's County, wherever it happens to be. How do you believe a nonprofit with funding would attack that? Uh, like Keith said, I mean, do you just throw money at it? Or no, is it education? Uh, is, it, is it tutoring? Uh, is it jobs? Jobs, food pantries, mm -hmm. uh, some kind of trades program. And, you know, what's, how, you know, what's the return on investment? Well, I'm sure that there'll be variables that the organizations will need to, um, that the organizations will need to, to, to show to, in, in order to, <laughs> to be funded. I'm sure this is not just a, we'll, look, we'll give you some money and you figure it out. Um, but organizations that have um, bona fide successes with um, people who are uh, very poor, living among folks who are, are driving um, anything they want to drive, everywhere they want to drive it. Living in the same communities, no, no next door to each other. One living in, on this side of the community, the other maybe living um, half a mile away. Uh, even though this is a Maryland story, this is... It's a Maryland and a national story, really. Well, the, the thing that I was going to say, and Keith, you know this very well, as a crime and course reporter, and, and all of these things that um, the, the government in the District of Columbia is trying... Wrestling with. They're, they're trying to do something mm -hmm. new. Mm -hmm. And on this program, we have had, uh, time and time again, those those nonprofits, those boots on the ground mm -hmm. people who are giving pushback on the you know the lock em ups mm -hmm. and trying to not just fix things now, but they're really trying to trying to address things that have been happening literally for decades. And that's, I think, was also what Maryland is trying to do. They're also seeing an increase in, in crime, mm -hmm. increase in Prince George's County. And a large portion of what's fueling this increase is the economy, is that oftentimes that individuals who don't have job skills are trying to find ways to bring in money, and bringing in money illegally, carjacking, theft, various, you know, uh, uh, stealing cars and stripping them down stealing cars and, and selling them online. Oftentimes, seeing young people who are actually the breadwinners, mm -hmm. ju juveniles, 16, 15, 16, 17-year-olds, bringing in money into their household illegally because unless they do that, there is no money coming in. Mm -hmm. And Maryland's probably seeing the exact same thing they're trying to address that. But yes, that's, that's what's the underlying issue that a lot of people are saying that's happening in the district is that there are no jobs for young people, and the, and the jobs that, that there are out there aren't I'm paying minimum wage. I'm not going to do it right. <laughs> and as a result, these young people have got to, are, are, are paying rent, their parents' rent, keeping the electricity on, are actually supporting their parents or mm -hmm. single parent or grandparents. Mm -hmm. Stuff is in their, the, their names. Yes. Um, <laughs> bills are in the kids' names. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, and, and that to me... And we, we spoke about that, you know, years and years ago where, kid, where, you know, parents have put, you know, bills in the children's name and screwed up their credit. But, you know, but to your point, Keith, it, uh, it, it's one thing where you can say, look, young man or young lady, you know, go out there and, and get a job and work hard, honest day's work. But this is the biggest, the, the bigger issue with rent. Correct. Is, is sky high in the DMV. Everything costs right. so much. And even Groceries. For, yeah, nice. exactly. Yes. And, and for those young people who may want, they may want to stay on the, on the right side of the law, but then they work, the taxes are taken out, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're working their butts off and they don't, and they come away with with nothing. It doesn't matter how many hours you get a job for, it's not going to make a dent. A exactly. And I think that's, you know, that's the other, that's the other issue of, you know, of poverty, not just, you know, the economic poverty, but I think these kind of things contribute to the poverty of the mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's also amazing how many people would believe that these young people are out here committing violent crime, 
because they don't have anything else to do. They're bored. They, they're, they don't know that the, the community center is down. No, a lot of these kids are out here supporting their, their families. families. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I hopefully, if the Enough Act of 2024 does pass by the uh, Maryland General Assembly, that there is a plan. Right. To you know, to address these pockets of poverty, because again, there are, there are so many, so many reasons why. Uh, again, education, mm -hmm. adult literacy. I mean, that's a whole show. You know that you yeah. know that's a whole show. So yeah, I uh, want to talk about uh, something else, and this is. There is so much news today <laughs> about the Washington uh, Commanders. Uh, yeah, mm. yeah, the FedEx Field. Yeah, how, well, Commanders Field now mm -hmm. because uh, FedEx decided to pull out. See ya. See ya. Exactly. <laughs> they decided to pull out of their naming rights. Uh, it's been reported that there was a clause that if ownership changed, that they could, you know, pull out. So mm -hmm. they pulled out two years ahead uh, to the tune of some, I think, $19 million uh, a year. That's a nice little chunk of change. Mm -hmm. And and at the same time, there's this hearing on Capitol Hill. I don't have the latest reporting because when we went on, they were still debating this issue about this 99-year lease turning over control of the RFK site, 174 acres. The mayor wants a new stadium um, as obviously a lure for the commanders, uh, retail and, and, and housing. That, that, that's a, that's a, that's a steep hill to climb. Deborah. She, she wants, she, she got to get a team in here now. She has, to get, she has to get a team in here now. Yeah. She has to get a team in here now. Yeah. She has to get somebody in here. So she she's like, I, I hear you, Angela, but I'm gonna compete for um <laughs> for the football team and I'm gonna bring them back in. Well, what was what's, what's fascinating is that you know, now the Commander Stadium, as, as, as now we call it. Commander's Field. Commander yeah. Field. Uh -huh. Um what <laughs> how this how how it's gonna look over the next couple of years, because mm -hmm. now they can make it look however they want. They are now, you know, the new, the new owner of the team can go in there and, and, and refurbish things and make it and make it much more attractive to bring in a top dollar uh, company to really take over that field. So they have at least two years to, to really, and Harris has the money. He can do all that. And Magic Johnson, they can come in there, you know, and, and make that and make that field much more attractive to bring in a much larger uh, a, a partner. A corporate partner than what FedEx uh, uh, FedEx was. That's what you're gonna take a look at. See, see what exactly happens over the next couple of years. How they spruce up the house to bring in a new buyer. That's what's gonna be interesting to watch. Well, well, the thing about it is Josh Harris has, has said that he's willing to spend 75 million dollars on this on the stadium in Landover for more suites. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he wants to bougie it up. My words, not yeah. yours. And, and, you know, it it is getting a little long in the tooth as... It's been long in the tooth. Right. And, you know, I mean, you know, what is the life of a, you know, of a stadium? But it, it seems if he's going to do that, that maybe he wants the commanders to stay. The, uh, on, on the Hill today, this, uh, this measure that the House was debating, uh, just about all of the Maryland members of the House were saying no mm -hmm. to to uh, Any money. yeah to, to and to moving the commanders out of Maryland. This is obviously you know a, an issue of of economics, no oh, question yes. about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, ironically, when I moved back here uh, in in two thousand one, the stadium was was new. And and you know, hey the. You know the, the the you know the former Washington football team, whatever whatever name they had this week. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know they they had they had just come from right. Washington. Now they're trying. You know now they're trying to move back, and you know we'll we'll have to see because even if this gets out of the house, the Senate still has to address this. And then, like you said, right. she needs to get a team together. What's the plan? 
But it's also interesting that this is bad, you know, timing, right? She's about to lose the Wizards. Right. How about that? You know, and 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 and, 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 and so she is desperate. The mayor. I, I need a team. She's like, I need a team. To try to bring this team back, <laughs> and she realizes that. And mind you, now, so now Harris is now Harris is in the catbird seat. He's like, okay, what do you, what do you all want to do? <laughs> you know, who's going to make? Who, who's going to make Maryland? Who's going to make me the best deal? Right. Best deal. And and now he's because he, now he realizes. That Mayor Bowser is is desperate for a team to come in there and and, and prop this up. He's going to sit back and say, okay, well, who's who's going to give me what what I want now? Harris is in, is, in, is really in the cat seat right now. And yeah. also Brooks is appears will she has been willing to do whatever she needs to do to keep um, to keep them happy right at, in their current home. So, like you said, um, they're they're in the cat seat. Yeah, but like Magic Johnson said during that big press conference when the sale was complete, the team needs to win. Mm -hmm. Because if they, if they win, then a whole lot of problems go away. If they get to the playoffs, and you know, I'm certainly not a football expert, but I do know winning. And if the team can win, then people will, you know, if you build it, they will come. If right. you win it, they will come. <laughs> if you continue to lose it, they're not going to show up. Except for, of course, the diehard. The diehard fan. <laughs> the diehard fan. Um, speaking of uh, being a fan, apparently Wallet Hub is a fan of Columbia, Maryland. Once again, a, a, a survey has put Columbia, Maryland in, in the top ten. Wallet Hub says that it is the, one of the happiest cities in America in 2024. No kidding. You know, no. Well, that's what it was created for. It was, it was created to be this utopia. That's, that's why Columbia was created years ago, right, decades ago, to be this utopia for the raising families and, and this, this uh, land of, of love and kumbaya and everybody holding Suburban hands. bliss. Suburban uh, bliss. Although yeah. it's not as happy as it used to be. Um, well, yeah, that's... Well, what is? Some, some folks have said, well, we don't like all these Baltimore people moving over here now to oh, Columbia. Oh, no, well, I, you know, I live in Baltimore, so... And I do shop in Columbia. <laughs> so all these, all these Baltimore people coming over here, so I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. Yeah. That, 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 <laughs> that is true, that um, some of the... Um, it's still a very happy place, but some of the um, strains of unhappiness are beginning to... Um, become a parent. Well, I, and, and I, will, I will also, uh, you know, say this, that, you know, when you, when you look at, as I said, the, you know, the suburban, the suburban bliss, um, you know, whether it's, you know, housing or, or anything else, in order to live uh, in that suburban bliss, you're going to have, you're going to need to have some money. You will. Those apartments, just the apartments, for example, are much more uh, much more expensive than in some of the you know the the neighboring areas of of Baltimore County, for mm -hmm. example, and and so I think that's I think that that's part of it. But uh, for anyone who has moved from one city to another. The biggest issue about Columbia, just like kind of, kind of like Montgomery County, the biggest issue is schools. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. It, it's everywhere. It is everywhere. It, you know, if you if you are a family with young children and you move from uh, Wisconsin or you move from Florida or where have you, what have you, and you move here and you've got a you got a great job and you're going to look you're going to look at, at the schools in Baltimore City you're going to look at the schools in Howard County you're going to look at the schools in yeah and and there and I think the reality is is that Howard County continues to spend you know a lot oh, yes. of money in its schools they're building more schools which is why <coughs> excuse bless me bless you <coughs> bless you Ooh, excuse me they come in threes. <laughs> Woo! We All right. Pardon me, people. <laughs> Which is why we're seeing Prince George's County, um, you know, rushing to build these schools with this partnership. Mm -hmm. Because if, if nothing else, public safety mm -hmm. and schools, de you know, definitely, hand hand. definitely the real deal. And if people are happy in Columbia, that, that suggests that something's going right with the school system. Right. I mean, that's what, that, that, you know, you, you hit the, the nail on the head, Harold, is that, that Columbia does invest in the schools. Um, does it 
is it doing enough though? That's the question. Is it doing enough to keep up with trying to attract people and to keep up with that utopia? I'm not sure if they want to attract anybody else. I think they, they just want to continue their schools, public safety, amenities, parks, um, nature. Columbia just has a, a, a wonderful cornucopia for those that live there and the few that they want to invite in. No, I, and see, I disagree with that because like most municipalities, mm -hmm. Um, you want to attract more people mm -hmm. who can afford to live there. And pay your pet tax and base. Your tax. Pay, even pay higher taxes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because retirees mm -hmm. are going to, you know, you want, uh, you want to attract the 30 and 40 year olds mm -hmm. who can afford higher taxes to keep up that, that, that tax base. And, and as, a, as a side note, as we know, yesterday, uh, Fairfax County met because they were saying that they have not had um, a property tax increase in quite some time. They say their schools are underfunded. Fairfax County, uh, got a lot of folks in Fairfax County. And so... Loudon is knocking on the door, so Fairfax is like, okay, we gotta up our game. Yeah. So, anyway, <laughs> real quick, if I can ask, um, wh what are you working on, Deborah, that you want to share with us? I am working on, I just, I, today I went to the HHS Forum on Black History Month where they talked H -H, about uh, Health and Human, Human Services, Services okay. Forum, um, where they talked about some of the issues that they are really dealing with in terms of health equity. Uh, and one of the issues they're dealing with now is making sure that um, they are doing maternal and infant health, that they, they're going to really zero in on that. Okay. Keith, what about you? What are you working on? Well, I'm, I'm following a trial right now of a 13-year-old Malachi Lukes who was killed in 2020, 13-year-old uh, over right, not too far right here on, on, on 7th and S, not too far from here. Um, he went some of his friends were just out playing basketball. And some, people, mm. some uh, according to prosecutors, uh, members of a gang came in and, and just shot up young people. Didn't know, didn't know these young people, didn't know whether these young people were part of a gang or anything, just saw young people in this, in this area, just shot them up, killed this 13 year old kid. Trial just started, mm. we are now, they just started opening, opening statements. Really tragic case. Yeah. Um, this young person you know, had so much to, you know, active in the community center. He, he created programs as a community center at 13 years of age, was killed just four days before his, his 14th birthday. Several cases like this going on in the courthouse now involving young people on both sides of the gun. It's a really, really tragic time. Keith Alexander, Deborah Bailey, thank you so much for talking to us. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That is The Daily Drum for this Wednesday, February 28th. I'm Harold Fisher. Good night. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.